All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our virtual field trip. My name is Casey Satteray. I'm the Donor Stewardship and Social Media Manager for Washington's National Park Fund, and I will be your host today. I know we have a few faces and a few a few unfamiliar faces and a few uh, regulars in the audience, but I wanted to share who Washington's National Park Fund is, if you don't know. WNPF, for short, is the official philanthropic partner for Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. We're incredibly fortunate to work closely with the parks and the park superintendents as we work to fund 30 to 40 different projects every single year. And through all of this work, our vision is to see that our parks are strong and vibrant, youthful and everlasting. Before we start, there are a few housekeeping items. This is a 45 minute trip with 30 minutes from our speaker and then a Q&A at the very end. Feel free to submit any of your questions in the box at the bottom as we go. And we also have closed captioning enabled. Um, which you can access at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We welcome any feedback as we work to make these trips as accessible as possible. Okay, who is ready to board the virtual bus to Olympic National Park? Kim sager Fradkin is the Wildlife Program Manager for the Lower Elwha Klallam Tribe in Port Angeles, Washington, where she has worked since 2007. Kim has a master's degree in wildlife biology from the University of Idaho and primarily works to examine wildlife response to the removal of the Elwha Dam and in support of tribal subsistence harvest programs. At present, she co-leads the Olympic Cougar Project, a collaboration of six tribes and Panthera, which we will learn about next. Kim, take it away. Great, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for being here on this gorgeous sunny day, or at least it's sunny in Port Angeles. Um, all right, are you seeing my screen? Looks good. Okay, fantastic. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, my name is Kim Sager Fradkin, and again, I'm the Wildlife Program Manager at the Lower Elwha Klallam Tribe. Uh, and prior to coming to the tribe, I was, I did work for 10 years inside of Olympic National Park. Uh, as a wildlife technician and uh, wildlife biologist before going to graduate school, studying bears in the Elwha before dam removal. But yeah, I've been at the tribe since 2007. And today I'm going to talk about a lot of the work that we do related to mountain lions. So again, making connections. And you'll see there's a lot of reasons that we have named the presentation making connections because we're making connections across boundaries and we're making connections across entities. So the Olympic Cougar Project started as a project of the Lower Elwha Klallam tribe. We were just really gonna do a small cougar research project. Um, we quickly partnered with Panthera and Dr. Mark Elbrock, um, who's the Puma program director at Panthera because he, um, had moved to the Olympic Peninsula. We have since brought in almost most, every tribe almost on the Olympic Peninsula, except for a couple of the West Side tribes. So we're working with the Skokomish tribe, the Macaw Indian Nation, the Quinault Indian Nation, and the Point No Point Treaty Council, which represents the Lower Elwha Klallam and Jamestown Klallam tribes. Um, so we have a large six tribe collaboration. We're also working with multiple universities. And while we do not work directly inside of Olympic National Park, um, we do surround the park and many of our cats enter the park and we do work closely with the park on a lot of our work. And as you can see here, every treaty area on the Olympic Peninsula incorporates Olympic National Park. So there are three treaty areas that cover our extent, our area of work. The Treaty of Point No Point, which encompasses the Lower Elwha Klallam tribe, and the Jamestown and Port Gamble Sklalem tribes and the Skokomish tribe, the Treaty of Quinault River, which encompasses all of the West Side tribes, and the Treaty of Nia Bay, which encompasses the Macaw tribe. The, tr the three treaties were signed by these tribes in 1855 and 1856, which began the federally recognized relationship between tribes and the federal government. 
In these treaties, the tribes gave up their lands, but at the same time, they retained many rights. The first was to hunt on open and unclaimed lands, to regulate the hunting activities of members, and to monitor and manage wildlife resources, which is a responsibility we now share with a lot of other entities. Subsistence harvest is a really important part of tribal culture. And tribes of the Olympic Cougar Project have a shared long-term community goal of monitoring and managing wildlife populations and preserving their intact habitats for the benefit of current and future generations for subsistence harvest purposes and for the greater ecological health of our shared regional landscape. That's just to really give some background on why, why are we even, why are tribes doing this? You know, you hear a lot about what the national parks do. You hear a lot about what the national forests do and DNR, but tribes have really robust programs. We work closely with our federal partners um, and we are funded often by federal partners. So the Olympic Cougar Project is funded primarily through a couple of grants from the Administration for Native Americans, um, grants from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, lots of Panthera funding, um, and we work with varied partners under these funding sources. We have three primary goals that I'm going to talk about today for the Olympic Cougar Project. The first is to calculate a population estimate of cougars and bobcats on a portion of the North Olympic Peninsula using two different methods. The second is to establish and maintain a grid of cameras to document the presence of cougars and other wildlife across the Olympic Peninsula landscape. And then finally, to examine cougar movement, home range, diet, and sub-adult dispersal patterns. So within the first category, how on earth do you think you calculate a population estimate of cougars and bobcats? How do we do it? These are elusive animals. Um, they live in often unroaded wilderness areas. As tribal biologists, we're used to um, sometimes flying over our species of interest like deer and elk and counting them from the air. They do that a lot in the national parks as well. You just simply cannot do that with cougars. Um, I'm assuming that some of you in the audience have seen them and have been fortunate enough to see them, but perhaps some of you have never seen them. Uh, because they are pretty difficult to find. So we actually used dogs and we used genetics. So first of all, we worked with a group called Rogue Detection Teams. They used to be part of conservation canines out of the University of Washington, um, but they are now on their own. And basically this group hires hound handlers and they get dogs. They find dogs that are generally unhomeable, honestly. Dogs that are really obsessed and like have a working drive and are obsessed with fetching. And they use that obsession and that drive for good. And they teach these animals to sniff out scat on the landscape. So different um, animals or different dogs are trained on different species. So we used a variety, three different dogs really over the course of three years that were trained to locate cougar and bobcat scat. And they came out for three years running and collected scat for us. We then worked with the University of Idaho um, and Cameron Macias is a Lower Elwha Clallam tribal member and graduate student. She is now finishing a PhD at the University of Idaho, looking at cougar and genetic excuse me, cougar and bobcat genetics on the Olympic Peninsula using scat. So she's able to take the scat that is collected in the field, scrape cells off of that scat and identify individual animals on the landscape. Our primary study area for this piece of the work was what we call the Pished Game Management Unit, which just borders Olympic National Park to the north. Um, we've got Lake Crescent, here in the center, if you guys can see it. Um, and this is, these are the boundaries of the Pisht GMU. And our Lower Elwha Clallam Reservation is over here. So this is our primary study area. Um, this group came out for three years running from 2018 to 2020. One handler and one dog would cover each of these 16 square kilometer grid cells hiking through here in one day 
and then they would pass through the entire study area and then do it all again. So two passes through the study area, they would collect samples. They collected 168 cougar scats between 2018 and 2020. And Cameron was able to put individual identities on each of those cougars. So what we're seeing up here in the upper right corner of the map is 24 individual cougars that were identified on the landscape. And you might be wondering why some of them are named. Um, I'm going to get to that part. We actually do capture and radio collar animals. Never in my entire career of a wildlife, as a wildlife biologist have I named study animals, but you'll see that we have captured a lot and it was getting confusing. So we started naming them like hurricanes and they're named alphabetically um, through, through the alphabet. Um, so interestingly, you know, many of the scats that were found on the landscape were cougars that we had had our hands on and had also gotten genetic material from in the form of hair um, when we capture them. So half of the cougars identified were cougars that we had seen and half of them were cougars that we had not encountered previously. And Cameron has just run some analyses and has really shown over the three years of our study an increase in the density of cougars on the Olympic Peninsula, or at least on the Pished Game Management Unit, from 0.57 cougars per 100 square kilometers up to 2.14 per 100 square kilometers. Um, and we have a sort of our range of confidence intervals here. You know, we don't know if that's a function of just how the scat detection dogs did. Um, but we really feel, because we were out there trying to catch cougars at the same time, that this is quite accurate. We were having a really hard time finding cougars in 2018. And by 2020, we were really finding a lot of them on the landscape. We knew there had been kind of a heavy harvest of cougars in 2018 um, by hunters. So we don't know if that is part of it. But cougar hunting is, is legal. Um, in, Park folks, you know, obviously it's not legal in parks, but outside of national parks, it is legal um, in limited numbers. Okay, so the second piece of our puzzle is how is another way of monitoring wildlife that we have engaged with is to establish and maintain a grid of cameras across the landscape to document the presence of cougars and other wildlife. So our goal and what we've done is we've deployed over 500 cameras per year across over 3,000 square miles on the Olympic Peninsula with a goal of developing a photo database of six culturally important wildlife species, elk, cougars, black bears, bobcats, and coyotes and their important habitats. And cameras, we really are putting, we are investing a lot of time and effort into cameras as are our partners at Olympic National Park. Cameras are in a lot of ways, a lot less biased than other ways that we can survey wildlife. We do not need to have a good weather window, for instance, to fly in a helicopter to count them. Um, we can see them in all types of terrain, whether it be super dense or very open, and we can get them during all weather, at all times of the year, and at all times of the day. Uh, we were then hopeful to use cameras to develop baseline population estimates for these six species, and then use these bases, these estimates as the basis for long-term monitoring. We at the tribes, um, because we want to manage and monitor for current and future generations, we really want viable tools to help us monitor wildlife populations. And so we really feel like cameras are that tool, and so we're investigating them on the study. And then we can also use the population estimates derived from cameras to compare those with the cougar and bobcat estimates derived from genetics that Cameron is working on in the lab at University of Idaho. So this was our grid in 2022, um, over 500 cameras on the landscape. And yes, there is a big hole in Olympic National Park. Um, we are, as I've mentioned multiple times, we are work, working closely with the park. Um, in fact, we have a graduate student right now a different graduate student at University of Montana who is a Panthera employee and he is working on sort of overlaying our cougar collar data with the camera data and he is going to be able to access all of the camera data from Olympic National Park um, and they do have camera data so we do work closely with them on sharing camera data. 
so we monitor these cameras generally for about three to five months a year. We deploy them starting soon in April, and we try to get them all out by about October out of the field. Um, and we use a lot of citizen science volunteers. This is a lot of cameras to manage. Over 500 cameras on the landscape is a lot. So we have a crew of citizen science volunteers that have adopted cameras, and those folks go out and check cameras for us. And these cameras are extraordinarily successful. We are getting all six species of interest. Um, we are getting deer. Sometimes we get deer sparring in front of our cameras. In fact, this last year, we got an image, a series of images of a deer giving birth in front of one of the cameras, if you can believe that. You can actually like see the contractions and then you see the fawn start to come out. You see the whole thing. You see her clean the fawn. She did it all in front of a camera. Um, so we get deer. We get elk and they're young, also allows us to get composition of the population. We get cougars of all ages. We get bobcats of all ages. Here's a mom with her two rambunctious kittens. We get lots of bears. Um, we get coyotes. And we pretty much are sure that they don't know the cameras are there, um, especially this guy right here. See, I gotta go back here. This is actually a different type of camera. This is a video camera, obviously, on one of our studies. This is a kitten of a cat that we have radio collared. So yes, they are very aware that the cameras are there. Um, and that one wasn't so sure what he thought of it. Um, but he has since become more of just, um, he's just decided they're play toys. And so this cat now does this when he finds a camera. He proceeded to go flip it in the air and pull a bunch of cords off of it. Um, okay, so with all of that fun footage, um, we have hundreds of thousands of images. And you can imagine that it's pretty challenging to get through hundreds of thousands of images using humans. So we are currently working with um, Panthera IDS, which is, um, it's a program written by our partners at Panthera, written by some folks, some bi biologists in South Africa. And it is an artificial intelligence software that allows us to plug a bunch of photos in and it actually tells us the species that are in the photos. I have to say that our first version of Panthera IDS for the Pacific Northwest did not work beautifully. Um, so we are retraining what's the, what's we call the classifier. So we have a really tough environment up here, especially compared to South Africa. We have a lot of structure in the forest. We have a lot of glowing branches. We have a lot of downed wood. We have a lot of ferns. Um, and it's sometimes hard to pick animals out of the photos. So we have sent it another 800,000 photos to try to train the computer program to actually be able to identify wildlife for us in the photos. Once we have the animals identified in the photos, we are testing um, a statistical model called space to event, which actually allows population estimation using camera data. So historically, you really needed an animal with spots. You needed a tiger or a leopard to be able to identify unique spots on the animal in order to be able to use cameras to come up with a population estimate. But this new model actually uses, uses the amount of space measured on the landscape by your camera to help you estimate populations. So we are working on that for all six species of interest and it is showing great promise. Um, there are a lot of partners at Panthera working on this, biostatisticians working on this, graduate students working on this. So we're holding hope that this piece um, of the project really works out for us and that we will, as tribes and in the park, be able to go forth and estimate populations year after year after year for monitoring purposes for all these important wildlife species. And then finally, um, the third goal of the Olympic Cougar Project is to examine cougar movement, home range, diet, and dispersal patterns. We're really interested in this for a lot of reasons, but one of the bigger reasons is that the Olympic Peninsula is slowly becoming an island. 
Um, we are surrounded by the Pacific Ocean, by the Strait of Juan de Fuca, by Puget Sound, and then by the Columbia River on the south. And where there is access to the mainland, there is Interstate 5. Um, Interstate 5 is definitely a barrier to wildlife movement. And we are very curious to know just how much of a barrier it is. There is a brand new paper that came out in, well, it came out in November looking at cougar genetics on, in Washington. And it found um, that there really are pretty alarmingly low rates of genetic diversity on the Olympic Peninsula compared to the mainland because dispersal board corridors have really been cut off. So we're really interested in understanding what habitats we can help protect going forward. Um, we know that the Olympic Peninsula is growing, as is every place. Um, we are experiencing habitat loss and we are experiencing increased development. We are experiences, experiencing changing um, climates and we are seeing climate refugees who are coming here um, to escape warmer climates and to escape the fire fires in other parts of the country. Um, so since 2018, our partners, our collective group of tribes have radio captured and radio collared over 90 cougars on the Olympic Peninsula. Um, all of the Scalum, Scalum tribes together up here on the North Peninsula have collared 38. Okomish has collared at least 23 and the Quinault has um, collared at least 31. And we are currently monitoring, actively monitoring about 44 of those cats still. Um, we do catch cougars using hounds. Um, they are not legal in the state of Washington for hunting, but they are legal for treeing um, cougars for research purposes. WDFW uses them a lot. Um, so we use dedicated hounds out of Elma and a father and son duo who are really amazing and really actually care a lot about these cougars. Um, so we catch cougars when we see tracks in snow in the winter, or when we get their photo walking by a different type of camera that we use um, called the cellular camera. We can put those on the landscape. And if we have 3G coverage, cell phone coverage, then we are actually able to document animals that are walking by. So when we get a photo of a cougar, we can run out and try to find that animal. Um, more often than not, we have a snowshoe hare like running in front of the camera at midnight while we're trying to sleep, um, but sometimes it's a cougar. Uh, so once we have a cat in a tree, we anesthetize it and safely and carefully get it out of the tree. We are very concerned about animal welfare. Um, so we spend a lot of time monitoring temperature, pulse and respirations. We wear masks um, because of COVID transmission and we, then apply a radio collar to the animal, put a radio collar on that is programmed to get one location per hour um, on these cats. So just an example of the type of data that we get, um, each color here just represents really the number of fixes. So these are not individual cougars, this is all the data combined. And so like this just means there's a lot of locations under this point. We have a lot of collared cats under here. Um, we definitely have a lot of cats that go into Olympic National Park. We have permits to work inside of Olympic National Park um, to pursue cats in that captures started outside or in rare instances to recapture and recollar cats that have settled inside of the park. Um, we, this is kind of what the data looks like close up. So really fine scale and amazing data. We are working with a group out of Seattle called uh, Earth Ranger, which is originally of the Paul Allen Foundation. Um, and basically this amazing software communicates with our caller software every night. And we can come in in the morning and see where our cats are on the landscape. We can look at this map and say, okay, well, there's one here, there's one here, there's one here, there's one here. We can click and see where they've been moving. We can get information about cats that have crossed the Olympic National Park boundary. We can get information about cats and when they are near each other. Um, and our data really provides an amazing opportunity to look at dispersal 
and how animals move across this environment. So if we look at this map here, it's kind of a yellow or orange or a yellowish green line that you're looking for right here. And this is a video, um, a video made of cougar movement data. So we are seeing this cat get pop into human dominated areas, that was Olympia, and then bounce back out. So like a ping pong ball, this cat is trying to find a place to go, comes down here, hits the Columbia River, bounces back up, hits, an, hits I-5, bounces back out, hits the Columbia, and continues to try to figure out exactly where to go. Um, this is a cat that has dispersed from his mother. Cats usually disperse from their mother when they are anywhere from 12 to 18 months of age. We see it more frequently at about 18 months of age. And that is a perfect example of why we wanna study um, cougar movements and what habitats are important to them and how roads might be a barrier. We had another Can cat. That, yeah? Uh, just one uh, second. Do you mind moving that box at the top of your screen? Sometimes it blocks some of Oh yeah, no problem. It's funny, no it, wasn't there. it wasn't there for so long and then it popped back up and actually don't know how it got back there because I couldn't figure out if you guys were even there. Okay, good. There, how's that? There's still another, yeah, right there. Can you shift that box as well? There. Okay, perfect. How are we looking? Thank you. Okay, um, great. So that movement um, and the movement of another cat started to make us think about swimming. Um, we know that cougars will swim. And so we have a new paper out um, that's actually been featured a lot in the media recently about swimming cougars because we did have one cat that swam um, from here to here near Shelton. Unfortunately, he ended up being shot here on Squaxin Island. But we were really curious, like, gosh, he swam a kilometer. What if he does this? And then what if he goes through here? And what if he gets himself under I-5 at Nisqually? That would be super interesting. Um, so we started looking at all of the islands in the Puget Sound and in, really in the Salish Sea that could support cougar populations and that could facilitate movement. We know we have a lot of cats up here on Vancouver Island. So lots and lots of questions to be answered about dispersal. Let's see here, I think now I've frozen for some reason. Okay, there we go. Um, so we have one cat in particular named Bjorn that has an interesting dispersal. Um, I like to show his data. He, we caught him near Quilcene and he spent about six months there with his mom. And then he left when he was about 18 months old and went on his dispersal. And every time the color changes here, that is two weeks of movement, okay? So he basically traversed the entire Olympic Peninsula until he hit the Quinault. And then he decided to move himself inland. He came all the way through the park, down the Elwha, and has settled in the Elwha. Unfortunately, his collar has failed, so we don't really know exactly where he is. But over the course of his time of being collared, he traveled over, over 1,100 miles. Um, he really went into some human-dominated environments. If you can look here, we literally had him on Water Street in Port Townsend one morning. He just wanted to go north. He kept trying to go north and he kept running into human settlements. So an interesting conundrum for cougars on the Olympic Peninsula. They hit water or they hit highways. We are working with the Washington Wildlife Habitat Connectivity Working Group and Washington DOT to actually answer some questions about highway crossings. We have identified um, multiple potential crossing areas identified here by these purple and blue dots. Um, and these are related to human density, this being sort of low human density, this being really high human density. And we have placed cameras, four cameras at each of these potential crossings to see if animals, particularly cougars, are actually crossing at these places. Um, so we had 120 cameras deployed with DOT this last year, and cougars have crossed at several, several of those places. Um, a long-term goal for I-5 would be a crossing. Um, we know we have one that was completed in 2018 at Snoqualmie Pass, a new one that has started in, um, it started in 2022 in Southern California. 
Some of you may have heard about the famous P-22. Um, he was a cougar that used Griffith Park in LA um, and he died recently, but it was really P-22 <laughs> that started that effort to get a crossing in Southern California. Um, we know that animals are using the wildlife crossing at Snoqualmie. And so, you know, a long-term goal would be that. Our work was just featured on the cover of National Geographic Kids about just this question. And can cougars get off the Olympic Peninsula and what can be done about it? And I feel like the more research that we have, the more media attention there is on this, the more likelihood that we might actually be able to push this along. So finally, in my last five minutes, I'm going to just show you some fun videos. Um, we, one thing I didn't talk about is because we have such frequent data from these cougars, we are able to hike in to places they've been hanging out. We find bed sites, we find kills, we find kitten den, cougar dens, um, and we're able to put cougar or cameras on those places to document that why the cougar is coming back and the other wildlife that come in to eat. We know that mountain lions increase in ecosystems, health and biodiversity called mountain lions in the Rocky Mountains, but we call them cougars here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, carcasses provide food and nutrients for beetles and insects, and they feed a lot of other animals in the forest. So when we have leftover meat like this, we will go in um, and I'm going to have to look behind this screen to start playing these videos. And we're able to document and watch cougars do what they do and eat. This one was particularly exciting for us because this is an elk in Olympic National Park on the former mills reservoir. So this is a habitat that was inundated before the Elwha dams came out. And here we have elk using it and cougars eating those elk. We are able to really just watch cougar behavior um, as they eat these animals. We know that they shear their fur off. They don't want to be throwing up hairballs for days on end. Um, this is a fun series that is brand new. Um, I just put in this presentation for the first time. Um, oops, of a cat happily eating um, and crunching bone. And then we're able to, when she is done feeding, we get this fun series of videos of her very carefully hiding, caching her kill. The cougars will bury their kills. She does a very good job of it. Here she is still just making sure that she's done an adequate job. So she's still finishing up, but you can see, you can no longer see that kill whatsoever. So she's quite particular about hiding her kill. Brand new footage. First time this has been documented of a cougar on the beach eating a washed up seal, which is pretty amazing. Um, also alarmingly close to the highway, you might hear a car come by soon. Um, we are working with a videographer, a filmmaker, and this, these are some of his cameras that you can see in this image. We're also able to see cougar, cougars interact with other animals. Here we have, if anybody can see that skunk in the background, Skunks seem to be the one and only animals that cougars will tolerate on their kills because they don't want to see the skunk dance. They know they don't want to get sprayed. Even pretty young cats have figured out that they probably shouldn't mess with skunks. And so these brazen, brave little skunks come in and cougars generally tolerate. Um, bobcats, coyotes, any other thing that come into cougar kills end up being killed by the cat, but not skunks. And then we know that cougars are feeding the forest. This is a cougar killed here, but this bobcat is acting like it's its own, also caching it after being done eating. We get lots of eagles, ravens, and crows. We get both gold and bald, in, or excuse me, golden and bald eagles. Um, we certainly get the turkey vultures coming in to eat and we get bears. And then finally, I am out of time, but I'm gonna just real briefly show you a few fun videos. This one is very 
loud. Um, and so you might want to turn your speakers down because I can't turn mine down at the moment. But we get family group photos. So we get to see where cougars are denning and get images sort of into their secret lives at the den. So there is a mother coming in with her two very vocal kittens um, wanting to be fed because she has been away. She's going to move for the time. Um, they often move, move their dens around. Even when we don't have cameras there, we see that they're frequently moving them from place to place. Um, we get images of the cougars just being themselves, keeping each other warm while mom is gone. We get to see them grow, um, become large, and start to learn how to interact with their environment. We, we see them as they start to hunt with their mom and figure out how to get in there to eat with her. Some of them are timid about coming in and asking to eat. And some of them are not so timid. Pretty sure that that little boisterous one is the same one that attacks our cameras. We get really amazing vocalizations, listen up. So that colored one is actually the kitten, the year old kitten with her mom chirping like a bird. And then finally this amazing vocalization from a mom yelling our camera and calling for her kitten. We have an amazing team that makes all of this work possible. Um, this is just the team, really, of the Lower Alwaqalam tribe and Panthera. Every tribe has an amazing team like this. Um, so a lot of people make this work happen, as well as veterinary support, our hound handlers, and many entities and agencies that allow for land access. Um, if you're interested in more, there's been a lot of media attention. Um, you can look up the Olympic Cougar Project, Reuters did a story, CBS Morning News did a story, the Wild Podcast out of KURW, GeekWire, um, and of course, most recently, National Geographic Kids. And now I am here for questions for our last few minutes. That is super cool. Thank you so much, Kim. I feel like I could watch those videos for hours. <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> yeah, they're a lot of fun. Um, let's open up the Q&A box for folks. So if you have any burning questions, um, feel free to submit it at the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. I'll kick it off with some that I'm seeing here. Um, not a comment or not a question, but a comment. Just wanted to say that that was a fabulous presentation. Thank you. That was from Thank Rhoda you. Lawrence. Thanks. Um, my first question, let's see here. Uh, when newborns come out or are you know, you see them on videos and webcam or wildlife cams. Do you try and collar them as soon as possible? Or how do you decide which ones put it, that you put a tracker on? Yeah, excellent question. Um, we are very keen to have mothers and kittens because those kittens will become dispersers. And they're the ones that are real, especially the dispersing males that are really going to tell us a lot about those important habitats in those highway crossing areas. So we like to keep the mothers radio collared. And then we, we do now, we generally are not handling the kittens, but we have started just taking a quick sample and putting in like a little really itty bitty little avid chip in them so we can identify them later. But mostly we keep track of the mothers until the kittens, until we know the kittens are about at dispersal age. And then we will go attempt a recapture attempt of the mother um, and the kittens and sometimes they're elusive, like that mom with the two, the rambunctious ones, the one, the second one came running in, we call her zebra and her two cat kittens. Um, and that's the camera eater as well. And the camera swatter, one of them, we cannot catch. We've gotten one of them, but the other one, he, I don't know if it's the, I can't decide if it's the rambunctious one that we can't catch or if it's the rambunctious one that we have, I don't know. But we do, we try to catch um, at, when they're about 12 months old. Um, we go back and try to catch the kittens. That's a great cool. question. That must be a very hard job to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, this one's from Michael Collins. Do cougars prefer wildlife highway overpass corridors or will they use corridor tunnels created beneath a highway? 
excellent question that I don't completely know the answer to, except for the except for my information about Snoqualmie. And I know that at Snoqualmie, they've been documented using both. Um, and especially, I think most recently, one of the under tunnels. So they will use both. Cats have absolutely zero problem crawling in to holes and dense areas. I mean, you should see the places the Olympic Peninsula cougars use. Like we're constantly crawling on our hands and knees through the nastiest thickets to find their kills. They, they will definitely go through things. Wow. Um, and as a member of the public, if we see a cougar sighting, um, should we notify anyone or do we just keep that to ourselves and tell our friends? What should we do? Yeah, there's actually, this is a great question. Um, there is a website out of the Woodland Park Zoo, and actually she wrote to me recently, and I need to get back to her, called Carnivore Spotter. Um, and it is a place that you can go and log your observation. That would be cool. I mean, if you just see it, the state doesn't need to know or anything, but certainly that Carnivore Spotter would be cool to put it on there. Nice. Um, this one's coming in from one of our previous board members, Larry Hewitt. Do okay. you report general locations of cougars as a warning to hikers, i.e. cougars near Miller Peninsula or Nia Bay? We do not. Um, we actually had an unhappy landowner just this morning because he wants us to tell him when the cougar is on his land. Um, we, we can't do that. I mean, it's, um, it's a great question. It would be a full-time job for one thing for us to do that. And these animals have always been there. And, um, you know, yes, we have sort of extra information because we have these radio collars on them, but we just want people to understand that they live in cougar country mm -hmm. and that they could encounter one at any place at any time. You know, I mean, sometimes it's, it's rare places like Bjorn when he did his big cross um, peninsula one. I mean, he spent like three days at Fort Warden in Fort Townsend. Certainly nobody would expect to see a cat there, but I think that mostly we all just need to know that we live in cougar country and act accordingly. Great question. In relation to that, what should we do if we encounter a cougar? Um, look big, do not run. Pick up your children if you have them, put coats over your head, scream, yeah, not scream, yell. Um, and probably a lot of you saw that video of that runner in Utah, that thing made the rounds a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah. It finally, he finally was brave enough to lean over and pick up a rock. But if you can throw something, that is a really good way to have them move on. I will say that working on this project, I used to be a lot more fearful of cougars. It is not impossible that they will attack, but it is very unlikely. Um, it is very likely that they have seen you and that they just get out of the way. We hike in sometimes to active kills to put these cameras up when we know the cougar is nearby and we have never had an encounter. We have never had one come and even defend its kill or approach us or try to scare us off. They do not want to be around humans and they will move on and then come back later. They definitely, for the most part, want to avoid us. That's good to know. <laughs> um, we only have time for one more question here. Uh, this is from one of our community members. What's the easiest or most effective way for someone to get involved to help if they're not a part of the project, i.e. volunteer programs, et cetera? What do you recommend? Mm -hmm. um, we do still take some citizen science volunteers if you're in the area. Um, every so often we take people to help us go through the videos because our AI is not perfect yet. Um, and so you can email me um, and my email is in, is Kim. And I don't know if we want to put it in the chat. Oh, um, yeah. The chat's off right now. <laughs> okay. It's I'll, I'll include it into the bio um, when we okay. post it on our YouTube page. Great. Yeah. People can email me and people... If there are questions that we haven't gotten to today that people are just feeling really pressing and really want to ask, you are welcome to email me today and ask. I will be in front of my computer for the rest of the day on this beautiful <laughs> sunny day, unfortunately. Perfect. On reports. Oh, no. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you for uh, all the hard work that you do for this project, Kim, and 
thank you so much for putting time in your week to even meet with our community. I'm sure everyone here is very interested to learn more. Um, I would love to convert this virtual field trip into a blog so that maybe we can get more information other than just the 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but for now, we are wrapping up here. So I'm just going to do my, my closing remarks. Let's see here. Okay. Um, thanks again, everyone, for going to our April virtual field trip. We are proud to announce that we awarded a record-setting $1.1 million across all three parks that will support 42 different projects um, this year in these four following priority project areas. If you want to learn more about the different projects that we fundraise for, um, you can visit wnpf.org today. Uh, our, oh, I'm sorry, it's not even April yet. It's April next week. <laughs> April, our virtual field trip is with Luke Bird. He is a Wenatchee teen teenager who donated a major gift to all three parks this past year. Um, this unique virtual field trip is happening during National Park Week on the 26th of April, which will be hosted by members of our DEI committee. And I'm really excited for him to meet everyone and for you all to get to know one of our youngest donors to date. So if you want to sign up, it's on our website at WNPF.org. We also have a blog about Luke, so you can read about him before we even meet him. I also want to mention that WNPF will be taking a break from virtual field trips during the summer months as we did last year. Um, that just allows our staff to go out to the parks and enjoy, you know, the beautiful scenery, as you all know. So we'll be back in the fall months and winter months to kind of catch you up on what has been going on in the parks. So thanks again, everyone, for showing up today. Thanks to Kim for presenting with us. And uh, if you want to watch more virtual field trips, we have them all up on our YouTube channel. Just search Washington's National Park Fund. Thank you all. Have a good one. Thanks so much.